Hello there. Today we're looking at what matters in on policy reinforcement learning, a large scale empirical study by Google Brain. Um, on a high level, this paper investigates a five different continuous control tasks, and they train agents with all the different choices that you can make basically on these continuous control tasks. So the different choices are like network width and height of the value and policy network, learning rate, type of loss function, regularization constants, and they train all of these agents and they try to parse out what works in general and what doesn't. And uh, they have some surprising findings uh, that uh, number seven will surprise you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's the that's the study on a high level. Um, as always, if you like content like this, consider subscribing and sharing it out. That would be excellent. So they say that on policy reinforcement learning has been successfully applied to many different continuous control tasks. Um, while RL algorithms are often conceptually simple, their state of the art implementations take numerous low and high level design decisions that strongly affect the performance of the resulting agents. Those choices are usually not extensively discussed in the literature, leading to discrepancy between published descriptions of algorithms and their implementations. So the sort of things they mean here are the things that when you read the paper, the algorithm will be sort of described pretty well on the main idea. But then if you look at the code, there's a whole bunch of hacks there. Like on the Atari environment, you have to repeat certain actions, you have to introduce sticky actions, then the question is, do you have like a random start? Or do you always start at the exact same time? Uh, therefore, the randomness of the level is not given, then you whether or not you normalize certain um, observations. But we've had these things even in supervised learning or NLP, things like this, we've had pre processing, I remember the ResNet first ResNet paper that beat ImageNet uh, to a significant degree over the last year's baseline. It was Oh, yeah, we have the simple idea of the ResNet. And then they have an entire section where they go, Oh, and we do this normalization, we do this pre processing, we do this and this and this and this and this. And um, I mean, there's an argument to be made for all of these these choices, but often it's hard to disentangle if the choice uh, choices of these pre processing things or whatever the choices are matters, or if the idea in the paper matters. And it's also very hard to compare different things. So what they're doing here, so I would say this is not only a problem in RL, this is a problem generally, they say, as a step towards filling the gap, we implement over 50 such choices in a unified on policy RL framework, allowing us to investigate their impact in a large scale empirical study. So a large scale empirical study, it basically means grid search over these choices, it's kind of smart grid search. We train over 250,000 agents in five continuous control environments of different complexity and provide insights and practical recommendations for on policy training of RL agents. So as far as I could figure out uh, the code and or and or the checkpoints of these 250,000 agents, or the code of this unified on policy RL framework is not available yet. And I don't know if it's going to be but basically what they're doing is they're building one agent. So in usually you have this agent environment dichotomy right here, you get observation and reward. And here you get you give action, they build one single agent that has a lot of switches that has a lot of like flags that you can say, okay, either do you want this loss or this loss? Cool. Do you want this regularization or this regularization? And, and if so, by how much, right? and so on. So I have a, this agent with lots and lots and lots of switches over 50 of these choices that they implement right here. And they can basically turn each one on and off. And therefore, they can investigate uh, these algorithms. So let's jump over the most surprising finding, um, which Okay, the most I can tell you the most surprising finding is that the initialized the policy initialization scheme matters significantly. 
Um, that's what people maybe didn't know. What also matters a lot is the learning rate and um, things like the discount factor. But I think people in RL were already familiar with that. I find it also interesting what doesn't matter, namely most things seem to not really matter too much, but there might be other explanations for this. All right, so they say we consider the setting of on policy reinforcement learning for continuous control. Now, this is where I have a bit of a of a problem right here. Um, because the title is what matters in on policy reinforcement learning, it's not what matters in on policy reinforcement learning for continuous control. They do say in the abstract here, as you've already seen, in the last sentence that they have continuous control environment, five continuous control environments. Uh, but yeah, I get it, you need to make the title a bit clickbaity, but the title overstates a bit what this paper says, this paper basically says, what works in these particular five continuous control environments, right? So they vary a lot of things with respect to the agent, but they keep the environments relatively constant. And it's not five diverse environments, it's five Mujoko continuous control environments that are very, very, very similar to each other in terms of their observation, in terms of how the world works and so on. Um, so consider this paper as an investigation in what works and doesn't work for these five and possibly for very relatively close environments. So that's, that's I think my biggest trouble I have with this paper right here is sort of it overstates uh, what it what it says in the title. But I mean, the investigation itself is done, I feel very, very well. So they say they have a unified on policy learning algorithm, where they researched prior work took popular code bases made a list of commonly used choices and then implemented everything into starting from the seed RL code base seed RL is kind of a framework for uh, distributed or for reinforcement learning in general. And they say whenever we faced uh, we were faced with implementation decisions that required us to take decisions that could not be clearly motivated or had alternative solutions. We further added such decisions as additional choices. So this, I feel, if I write research code, this is generally what I do, right? I write my research code and whenever I come to a place where I'm like, should I use this or this? Should I use this optimizer or this optimizer? I simply make a flag and then even if it's just one choice for now, right, just make a flag and uh, parameterize everything. And that's, that's, that's the thing here, they parameterize everything. But uh, other than I would do now, then I would sort of sparsely explore the space of these parameters. Now they do a more dense, ob dense uh, observation or dense sampling of this space than m my, me myself would do with limited resources. Of course, being Google, it is possible to do these kinds of things where you investigate all the choices. So they say here difficulty of investigating choices. The primary goal of this paper is to understand how the different choices affect the final performance of an agent and derive recommendations for these choices. There are two key reasons why this is challenging. Um, first, we are mainly interested in insights on choices for good hyperparameters. Yet if all choices are sampled randomly, the performance is very bad and little training progress is made. So that means if you have if you have all of these hyperparameters, then let's let's consider like a three dimensional um, hyperparameter space, then there are combinations of hyperparameters that are very good right here, maybe here. So there's this, this cube in here. That's sort of very good but the rest aren't really good. So if you just simply sample from anywhere in the space, like here, or here, or here, or here, or here, uh, you will, we will basically never get anything that works, you sort of have to hit the combination correctly. And that's, that's a problem in three dimensions, but it's way more a problem in 50 plus dimensions like they have here. So they have to resort to a different strategy. Um, they have to go and basically start out from a good configurations, where they say 
they group these, we create groups of choices around thematic groups where we suspect interactions between different choices. For example, we group together all choices related to neural network architecture. We also include the learning rate in all of the groups as we suspect it may interact with many other choices. Then in each experiment, we train a large number of models where we randomly sample the choices within the corresponding group. All other settings for choices not in the group are set to settings of a competitive base configuration that is close to the default PPO versus uh, V2 configuration. Okay, so what they're doing basically is they're saying, now let's let's consider these. So these groups, you can now think of, of single dimensions in this space. So, or, yeah, so let's consider the space of groups. Let's say you have two different groups. One is the group of network architecture parameters and the other one is the group of learning behavior, like learning rate and training algorithm parameter. What they're saying is they're saying we know of a configuration right here that is good. This is PPO versus two, V, version two. <laughs> and now what we're going to do is we're simply going to keep in each experiment, we're going to, if we want to investigate the network architecture, let's say that's this axis, we're going to keep all the other groups the same as this default configuration. Um, and only investigate only basically move this point to the left and to the right. And we, we're not going to move it up and down, we're going to keep the learning dynamic parameters of the other group or all of the other groups are going to keep the same and only move it in in the architecture parameter space. Now, of course, this is not just one parameter this since they make these groups, this is a multi multi parameter. So at each point here, you can imagine like a little subspace of the inner group and they then sample from these. And that becomes much more feasible, right? So now maybe you have, um, let's say you have 10 groups of five parameters each, you can densely sample five parameters, like that's sort of possible, you cannot densely sample 50, but you can densely sample five. So what you would do is you would keep the other 45 constant, that would correspond to this dimension and all the other dimensions, and you would only vary within the group, which would correspond to this dimension. But now you see that the problem again, of course, is that you're always starting from this point, and you're basically only exploring along the axis of this of this group space, uh, because you always keep one con keep the others constant. And that basically, to me, that means that these experiments are going to be heavily favored in, in terms of which of the algorithms is closest to this, to this baseline, because if so, if I go uh, with, with this particular algorithm, I know that these parameters are the best for this particular algorithm, uh, where if I now use any other algorithm, these parameters might not be the best. And my only, my only way of adjusting to that other algorithm is by individually moving here while keeping others constant. So I can basically only improve with it along one of the groups. I hope this makes sort of sense that it feels like this experiment biases the results in favor of whatever is made, whatever choices are made in this baseline. So keep that in mind. Now, that being said, PPO, of course, is a very popular baseline. So it makes total sense to use that as a as a base to explore from. But it's not like they're doing an actual dense grid sampling of the space, they're doing a sparse sampling in the group space, and then a dense sampling within each group. Alright, so they let's go into the experiments. The first thing they investigate are the policy losses. Now this is um, this is a rather uh, important topic. And that basically means how do you train the policy? And the choices here are, of course, PPO, like we saw the proximal policy optimization, but there are also others, namely, for example, um, policy gradient, you might know that if you learn about uh, reinforcement learning, you will inevitably learn about policy gradients, like the first thing you learn next to Q learning. And then V trace is another uh, sort of policy loss. Vtrace is optimized for distributed uh, reinforcement learning. Um, 
and they have a bunch of others and they here they say the goal of this study is to better understand the importance of the policy loss function in the on policy setting considered in this paper the goal is not to provide a general statement that one of the losses is better than the others as some of them were specifically designed for other settings now i of course i agree with this uh with this statement it's nice that they repeat it again right here so all the results right here are just valid for these environments um, or environments very similar to these and you have to keep in mind that the, the baseline parameters are ppo v2 and they only ever vary one group from these baseline parameters so that's why in this experiment for example it doesn't seem too surprising that the ppo loss as you can see outperforms in every single experiment here um, whereas the other losses underperform so their recommendation is use the ppo policy loss start with the clipping threshold to 0.25 but also try lower and higher values if possible because they have found and they have they have more experiments so in the appendix the appendix is full of these experiments and you can go and look at them um so they but the the general recommendation here for them is to use the ppo policy loss if you have these continuous control tasks and that there is a strong influence of this clipping threshold that is in ppo second thing network architecture and that's basically you have you always have a value network and a policy network and the question is how many layers how deep and so on uh, should you make them these things here are just mlps since this is continuous control tasks you don't learn from pixels as far as i understand it you learn from the states or the sensors on these uh, robot simulated robots now you got this here they say separate value and policy networks appear to lead to better performance on four out of the five environments um and further regarding network sizes the optimal width of the policy m of the policy network depends on the complexity of the environment and too low or too high values cause can cause significant drop in performance while for the value function there seems to be no downside in using wider networks moreover on some environments it is beneficial to make the value network wider than the policy one e.g on half cheetah uh, the best results are achieved with 16 to 32 units per layer yada 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 um the <laughs> so some there is this is a thing that sort of crystallizes out of this paper because what you're doing is you have this um one policy network and one value network like it's it's this um dichotomy where the value network tries to estimate the reward and the policy network tries to maximize the value so you have you have two learning things here you have this is learned and this is learned now there is a certain degree of interaction as the value network of course the, the reward is dependent on your policy so the value network sort of has to uh, take into account the policy when it estimates the reward but it seems to be that the policy network is the brittler one and therefore uh, more care has to be taken to optimize it whereas the value network seems to be a bit of more robust to changes and we've seen this already in that uh, the 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 loss choice for the policy seems to be quite important and here also the network parameters for the policy seem to be the things you have to actually tune per environment whereas for the value you can pretty much go you can pretty much get any wide network will kind of do okay so they say as for activation functions we observe that tan h activations perform best and relu perform worst which is interesting right because you would think that uh, in other deep learning tasks, relus have become pretty popular and usually outperform these others, other activation functions. But in this case, no. But this could also be due to other things because, again, they go from these default parameters, which, for example, do not have entropy regularization built in. And if you have a relu where it's basically an unbounded function, um, 
whereas the tan h is sort of a more or more bounded function. Um, so that could be, you know, there could be significant interactions here where they have split the groups and then the choices might be reversed if in the other groups these parameters were different. But for now, apparently, uh, tan h activations perform best. The interesting thing here is they say, interestingly, the initial policy appears to have a surprisingly high impact on the training performance. So this is how you initialize the policy network. Again, policy network appears to be the more brittle one and the one that you have to tune more. The key recipe appears to initial the key recipe appears is to initialize the policy at the beginning of training so that the action distribution is centered around zero regardless of the observation and has a rather small standard deviation. This can be achieved by initializing the policy MLP with smaller weights in the last layer. So if you have this policy MLP as multiple layers, and then it needs to output an action distribution, right? So in, in these in these continuous control tasks, you basically, uh, for each of the joints you have to affect. So you have like a, a little, you have like a little walker here with um, four legs and what's that? That's like eight joints or something. So you have to tell this how much force it needs to apply to each of these joints. And as I understand it, that's usually given by the network outputting a mean and a standard deviation, I might be wrong here, but uh, mean and a standard deviation for the distribution of action, that's going to be applied here. And then this is sampled. Uh, from that distribution, the actual force is then sampled. Um, now they say you should initialize the network such that the mean here is zero across or over your observations. And the way to do that is to simply initialize this last layer here with very small weights. So you and I think their recommendation is to divide to initialize this by 100 times smaller weights than all the other um, layers. They say other choices appear to be less important. The scale of the last layer initialization matters much less for the value MLP, again, than for the policy MLP. Apart from the last layer scaling, network initialization seems does not matter too much. Yada, yada, yada. There appears to be no benefits if the standard deviation of the poly is learned for each state uh, or once globally for all states. For the transformation of policy output into standard deviation, soft plus and exponential perform similarly. So most of these choices in their case appear to be relatively similar, except the ones that they uh, point out. The recommendation here is initialize the last policy layer with 100 times smaller weights. Use soft plus to transform network output into action standard deviation and add a negative offset to its input to decrease the initial standard deviation of actions. Tune if this offset is possible. Use tan h as both the activation function if the networks are not too deep, right here. Um, this is probably where the ReLUs would start to shine. And transform these samples from the normal distribution to the bounded action space. Sorry, and to transform uh, using a tan h. Use a wide value MLP, no layers shared with the policy, but tune the policy width. It might need to be narrower than the value MLP. Now this here, this no layers shared with the policy, this might just this might be now a result that the policy is quite quite brittle. So if you can detach the value and the policy, uh, that might be of advantage. Which is also surprising, right? You would think that these two networks, if they are sh they have shared layers, they would learn more about the environment, but apparently not. Then normalization and clipping. So you get a bunch of normalization and clipping techniques, which is, for example, observation normalization. It basically means that whatever comes in, you normalize it to a given range. So that's usually you do that for supervised learning, like if you have. Um, if you have MNIST uh, digits, so this is a mostly black image with, okay, can I even draw on this, with like a small portion of it is white. And 
what you want. This is usually in the range of 0 to 255. So you have 0 to 255. What you want to do is you want to normalize that such that it's in the range negative 1 to 1. Or alternatively, such that its mean is 0 and its standard deviation is about 1. So people use uh, both things and they tend this alone tends to already boost the performance. So the fact that it's non that this is non negative. And uh, the f also the fact that this number is somewhat higher than sort of in the zero one range. These are quite important. And they're going to figure out that this is also important right here. So the recommendation is always use observation normalization and check if value function normalization improves performance. So for value function normalization, I, I believe you would, uh, you would um, normalize the output of the value function. So instead of the value function telling you this is how much worth something is, it simply can tell you sort of that it's more or less worth than something else in a normalized range. Uh, gradient clipping might slightly help but is of secondary importance. Cool. Um, yeah, so all the other things also don't seem to matter too much, uh, like per mini batch advantage normalization, and gradient observation clipping. Uh, yep. Then advantage estimation. So advantage estimation in reinforcement learning is it basically the the value network needs to be trained, right? So you take a step and a step and a step and a step and in each step you get a reward and you get you perform many steps now the value network sitting right here needs to be trained to predict the total reward that you can get from here on until the end of the episode now usually what you do is you can bootstrap this by sort of a temporal difference thing in that you consider the you you consider a few steps into the future. And then you ask your own value network what it thinks of the rest of the episode. Right? So basically, you train, you don't train on the entire rest of the episode, you train on the difference between this and this. And then you can get way more complicated where you actually um, ask your value network at each step what it thinks, and then you go to that value network while integrating this reward but you also go to this value network while integrating these two rewards and so on. And then your target becomes sort of a mixture of all of these things, uh, you can get super complex with these, uh, with these different variants. And they say we compare the most commonly used advantage estimators, n step GAE and V trace and their hyperparameters. Um, and their recommendation is use the GA with lambda equals 0 0.9. Okay. <laughs> um, I feel this is not this is not uh, too, too, too surprising right here, because um, this this end step is a very basic estimator, and the GA and the V trace are better. And they say the GA and the V trace, they appear to perform better. Um, and they have not found a significant performance difference between the two. So cool. Last thing, no, this is second, second to last thing, almost last thing, training setup. Now I believe this, um, this becomes more important. So they investigate choices related to data collection and mini batch handling. So the number of parallel environments, the number of transitions gathered in each iteration, the number of passes over the data, and so on. So this is going to to matter quite a bit. Uh, the recommendation is to go over experience multiple times. So what you do in these environments is always you have a phase where you collect experience. And then you have a phase where you learn from this experience. And so you collect experience, you start from here, you collect a bunch of experience, you put all of that experience into a buffer, which is like a, a database. And then you have these, what they're called traces, right? So all of these are now episodes that your agent took. Now all of these episodes consists of many, many steps that the agent took. 
So here is one step, here is one step, here is one step. And each of these steps are going to be one training sample. So each of these steps and also here and here are going to be one training sample. There are multiple problems here. The first and obvious one is if they if you just leave them in order, then you, you'll have very, very uh, correlated mini batches and that's not good. So you want to kind of shuffle them around in here. Uh, each time before you go to the room. So you can go through them multiple times in different order. And that works really well. They say you should go over your experience multiple times, since that doesn't hurt you. And it alleviates you from the necessity to collect more data. The second thing they say is you should shuffle individual transitions before assigning them to mini batches. Okay, we've, um, we've concluded that and you should recompute advantages once per data pass. Now what's the point, the point here, before we talked about you have to you have these advantage estimators, which basically means you have to look for each step, you have to look ahead, a couple of steps, decide what the value of this state is or the advantage. And in order to do that, as we have seen, you kind of look at your own estimation of that future value. So you have this value is dependent on your own estimation of the future value. Now, of course, if you just do, if you can only do this, if you have these episode traces, if you have these blue episode traces still around, you know, which step comes after which you cannot do this anymore. Once this is all in mini batches and shuffled. Um, so what some people do is they simply compute these things once at the beginning, uh, with the value network they have, and then they go multiple times over this data, and just they shuffle, they might shuffle each time, but they keep these estimates. And that's, of course, is more and more out of date, the more often you go over the data. So what they recommend is, you should always go back to this uh, set data set, recompute these estimates with your current value network, then do the whole shuffling thing again, and then do another epoch and then basically come back to here, again, and recompute the advantages. It, so it makes a lot of sense, uh, right, but they also find that this actually makes a difference. For faster wall clock time training, use many parallel environments and increase the batch size, both might hurt the sample complexity, but they get you a faster wall clock time which makes sense, right? If you have more environments, then um, you're going to collect more experience and uh, more different experience. And that will speed up your the time that you need for learning, you might collect more samples, though, so it will also increase your flops. Tune the number of transitions in each iteration if possible. Okay. So next thing is time step handling. What do they do? the choices related to the handling of time steps. So this is the discount factor frame skip. So in these environments, you can choose to like ignore intermediate frames, um, how episode termination due to time step limit are handled. And their main thing here is that the discount factor is one of the most important hyperparameters and should be tuned per environment and to start with a 0.99 discount factor. Try frame skip if possible, there's no need to handle environments step limits in a special way for large step limits. Okay, so the discount factor, which is also unsurprising, right, because the discount factor is basically how how much you discount future reward. And that is inherently dependent on the reward structure of the environment itself. So it's really unsurprising that this is a big uh, an important hyperparameter, but it's good to note. And then last sec, okay, there's more second to last thing, optimizers, they investigate different optimizers. Um, we investigate two gradient based optimizers, Adam and RMS prop, as well as their hyperparameters. And their result says, you should use Adam with momentum, though I think they, they found that RMS prop isn't too much behind that. Um, but they say, you should tune the learning rate, absolutely, which is also known in the community, right, you can't you, you, if you have a different problem, it might require a different learning rate, and they find the learning rate to be a important parameter for um, an important parameter for these problems.
so you should tune it. But the other parameters of the of these algorithms aren't too much of an influence, at least on these particular problems. And then the last thing is regularization. So in regularization, uh, they try different regularizing methods such as um, entropy regularization, soft constraint entropy should not be lower than some threshold, callback Leibler divergence between a reference distribution and so on. And they say we did not find evidence that any of the investigated regularizers helps significantly on our environments, with the exception of half cheat on which all constraints um, help. So they don't find a particular thing. But remember this again, this, for example, here, entropy regularization is used in the Impala paper, which is which in which proposes V trace. Now they here only have an experiment where they change the loss to V trace without entropy regularization. And in this case, they turn entropy regularization on with the PPO loss, as far as I understand the paper. And there you can already see that there is a space that is not explored that is the setting of the original paper that introduced the thing. And I think this this if you can remember this study, this study like are all GANs created equal, uh, they concluded that probably all GANs are created equal, especially like Wasserstein GAN isn't too much better than anything else. And the author of the Wasserstein GAN paper was furious because they didn't in they clearly said in the Wasserstein GAN paper that the atom optimizer doesn't work and they had to use RMS prop and then the RMS prop was not in that study included. So it seems that the limitations of being able to really densely explore these choices is quite, um, is quite hurtful in, in that you can only even though this is a super large scale study, and they trained so much, right, you can only ever make very, very, very limited, um, very limited, sort of conclusions in these things. And I would say, if you are in these types of problems, definitely consider their default settings. Otherwise, what I'd much rather do is to just go to like a piece of code that implements as close as an environment as possible to the one I want and take the hyperparameters from there. In the appendix here, they describe all of the things that they've tried with the choices of hyperparameters and all of the results. And you, you zoom in on like a random one, you already see that um, the results oftentimes are very diverse, very wonky, very much like, uh, maybe, you know, this thing isn't so relevant, or there's large performance differences um, that are unclear between the environments. So it remains to remains to be seen. But the main interpretation here is that you're probably going to have to tune hyperparameters for a while uh, <laughs> uh, on your own environments. All right, yeah, the appendix is really long. And if you want details, I invite you to look at it. And apart from that, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.